Well, it's good to be here tonight. And for those who are with us on YouTube, it's good to have you with us. Trust that God is going to bless us and encourage us as we look at uh, Hebrews chapter 2 tonight. But before we uh, do that, we're going to turn to God in prayer. Let's pray. Our Father, as we again look at you, and you give you thanks for the fact that you are our Heavenly Father, that you have condescended to make yourself known to us, that we are the children of the living God, that Christ himself has declared us to be his brethren. Thank you for that oneness, that union that exists between ourselves and him, and through him to you. And so we do pray your blessing upon us now, encourage us, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to sing together, my God, how wonderful thou art. Oh, hi. six o'clock is Mark Hall. Okay, then let's read from God's Word. We're going to read from Hebrews chapter 2. As you know, we looked at Hebrews chapter 1 last week. I wasn't expecting to be here tonight. You see, I, wasn't, I was thinking I was going to be in the congregation, but uh, David Evans, uh, unfortunately, has gone down with COVID, and hence, here I am. So we'll read from Hebrews chapter 2. Therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how should we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard, while God also 
bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. For it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come of which we are speaking. It has been testified somewhere. What is man that you are mindful of him? Or the son of man that you care for him? You made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him, but we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, shall make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified, all have one source. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation I will sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children God has given me. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Well, may God bless us and give us an understanding of his word tonight. I've just changed over my Bible. So uh, if you're wondering what I was doing, switching around quickly. But being as the reading was in the ESV, I... Uh, I've read it from there, but I'm going to preach from uh, the New King James Version. And this chapter, which is, um, I suppose, is one of those chapters that uh, very often preachers take because um, it's a direct reference, isn't it? You know, the first few verses of it, you know, is, is uh, usually used for gospel preaching, for encouraging people to take note of the things that they hear in order that they might come to faith and believe in God and uh, the danger of not uh, believing and not hearing or listening to what is being preached and the threat that is uh, involved in that. But when we're dealing with it tonight, uh, you know, and you were looking at it more from the Christian, shall we say, believer's uh, perspective rather than aiming at unbelievers, it's reveals to us something wonderful about the person of Jesus because when we were looking at um, chapter 1 last week, I don't know, you know what you remember about it, but um, you know, the fact is that he was dealing primarily with the deity of Jesus. He wants to show that here was the Son of God who had come into the world, that God had appointed him, brought him into the world to be our prophet, priest, and king, and you know, he had selected him. And uh, there was something very, very unique about the incarnation and the coming of the Lord Jesus, that uh, here was somebody who, even in verse 8 of chapter 1, is being described not only as the Son, but he is being described as God himself. And this is a, a quotation from Psalm 45, isn't it? But to the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever a scepter of righteousness, is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness, therefore God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companion. But the, the fact is this, isn't it? There is this tremendous declaration of who Jesus is. It's quite clear that God is saying to God, 
you know, your throne, you know, is a throne of righteousness. And the only way in which you can interpret that and understand it, really, is in the context of the Trinitarian view that we take of God, isn't it? That he is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And in the conversation that goes on within that Trinity, you do have the Father being able to speak to the Son. I've uh, met Jehovah's Witnesses at times and taken them to these verses and um, dealt with them in such a way to show, try to show to them of how Jesus is literally God incarnate. And this is what you find here, you know, you get this wonderful picture of, of Jesus, you know, who is he? He is the eternal son, isn't he? He is the son of God. He is the one who has a name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. And here the comparison that is being made between Jesus and the angelic host is that Jesus is far superior to them. He has by inheritance received a far greater name. He has this name of son. And by being designated as a son, of course, he is raised up far above angels because angels are designated as servants. They are those who serve the Lord, serve God Almighty. They are the hosts of heaven that do the bidding of God. But when you come into chapter 2, there is a, a, a subtle switch, I suppose, in one sense. And uh, I'll show to you that it's not as subtle as what it might seem to be on the surface of things. And that is, when he is speaking about Jesus here, he, almost you could say like this, there's a contrast made that he is speaking about the humanity of Jesus. When he comes into chapter 2, he wants to show, you know, that this Jesus has become a man. And there are all kinds of things in this particular chapter that reveal to us that he was a man. Not only that he was a physical man, not only that he had a physical body and he lived like you and I in this world. He breathed air and he, you know, he walked around and he did all the things that you and I do. But more than that, he went through all the emotional side of human life. He was tempted in all points like as we are. There is this description made of him. We read about him, isn't it? In verse 14, Inasmuch then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil. And then again in verse 17, isn't it? Therefore in all things he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people, for in that he himself has suffered, being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. You see, the total humanity of Jesus is coming out in this, in the experience that he went through in this life when he lived in this world, and all of what he went through, he went through it as a man in a physical body with all the, the emotional side of our human psyche. And this is what we see here. And what we find is, of course, that Jesus has become a real man. He is not only the Son of God, but he is also described as being the Son of Man. And that emphasis, of course, is upon his nature, isn't it? The fact that being the Son of God, he has the very nature of God himself. He is God, you know. I know it's a big uh, controversy with Jehovah's Witnesses, isn't it? You know that son doesn't mean son; son means descent. But that is how the Jews understood it, is it? When Jesus said that he was the Son of God, you know, they accused him of blasphemy because he made himself equal with God. Why? Because he had said that he was the Son of God, and that's how they interpreted it. The Muslims understand it in the same way today. But when you come here, isn't it, you see, here is Jesus being exalted in chapter 1, comparisons made between him and the angels and how far superior he is above them. And then it goes on to say, you know, that for a little while he was made a little lower than the angels. In other words, there was this dissension or condescension in that he became a man. And he lived in this world as a man. But the interesting thing is, chapter, you see, is when he starts speaking about Jesus, what it does tell us is that it describes to us something of the preaching of the people of the day. And in verse 5, what you find is that is this tremendous declaration here. For he has not put the world to come of which we speak in subjection to angels. 
You see, the, the, what the writer is saying here, what he is describing really is the kind of preaching that they were involved in. Now, it's interesting, isn't it, to go back and see, you know, if you read through the Acts of the Apostles and you see some of the sermons that they preach and things, you know, and you wonder, well, you know, we've got some records of some of the things that they said. But what you have here is a clear declaration of the kind of preaching that they gave out at that particular time. You know, when Paul was uh, writing to the church in Thessalonica, you know, both in his first and second letters, you know, he describes the situation, isn't it? And the interesting thing about first and second Thessalonica uh, is that all, this, all the chapters virtually end with the second coming of Jesus. It comes back to it time and time again. And so there was this tremendous emphasis. And in some cases, you know, even in the church in Corinth and things, you know, there, there was this element of confusion, wasn't it, about the resurrection, what was going to happen when Jesus comes again. So there was this tremendous emphasis upon the second coming. So I would say like this, that true preaching is a declaration, isn't it, of the Christian hope. And the Christian hope is this, New world has to come, isn't it? Because here is this writer saying, for he has not put the world to come, of which we speak in subjection to angels. We speak about this world to come. You know, and the question is, you know, how often do we hear sermons where we hear of the world to come? How many times are we encouraged to fix our eyes upon that world to come? You know, the Christian hope is, isn't it, the hope of glory, the hope of seeing Jesus, the hope of entering into that new world. And that new world is far more than just us, you and I, merely going to heaven. Now, there's something wonderful about that, isn't there, you know, absent from the body to be present with the Lord. You know, leaving this world and leaving this earthly body behind, and then in our spirit, going into heaven to view and behold the glory of God. But that is not all. Redemption is something that extends beyond humankind or mankind. It delves into the whole aspect of the whole of creation. And you see, the exhortation here is that these people should be listening to what they have been hearing. That they were not to, as it were, let these things slip away from them, but they should give attention to the things that they have heard. And this is why, you know, in, in chapter 2 and verses 1 and following here, isn't it? It says, therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. There's the danger, he says. For if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, and was confirmed to us by those who heard him. And God also bearing witness, both with signs and wonders and various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. Now it's interesting, isn't it, that what you've got in the, when the writer starts off in chapter 1, what does he start off with? He starts off with the inspiration that God gives to men to write and to record his message. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets. So what you've got, you've got this line, haven't you? Once you've got the prophetic line where God is speaking through these men, and now we come into the New Testament, isn't it? And then you've got these people, isn't it? The message of salvation was first of all in verse 3, isn't it? that was spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him. So here you've got this direct line, as it were, of communication. First from God to the prophets, to the people. Then from God, or through the Lord, to his apostles and out through them. It's almost as if the baton from the Old Testament is taken and handed over to the New Testament. And these preachers were getting up and preaching and telling people what they had heard about the salvation 
that the Lord himself had been preaching to them. They were here, you know, eyewitnesses, and they had heard the Lord, and they had been physically with him. They had heard his messages. They had seen his miracles. And they were communicating that message. And it was an ongoing message. The whole point is this, isn't it? That God himself has been relentless in speaking to man. Both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. God was working in these men to communicate his mind, his plan, his purpose. There in the Old Testament. Then coming through into the New Testament. And it tells us there in verse 4, isn't it, that God's also bearing witness, both with signs and wonders, various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit, according to his own will. So God himself was testifying. You know, you can read through the Acts of the Apostles, can you? And you can see, here with these men, they were preaching and telling people the message of salvation. But what was happening was that God was accompanying them. You know, both the Apostle Peter and the Apostle Paul, you can divide the Acts of the Apostles up into those two areas, can't you? You know, first the life of Peter, then the life of Paul. But the Spirit of God was at work. And God was testifying to the truth and to the reality of these things by supernatural power, by miracles that were being performed and executed through those who were preaching the gospel. And so you have this element here, the world to come, those who were preaching, those who were being used of God at that particular time, those who had spoken to Jesus, those who had asked him about things that were coming. And yet here you see it, don't you? That God himself was testifying to the reality of these things. But the important thing is the the world to come, isn't it? The world to come, in actual fact, is mentioned both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. You know, when we come to, you know, reading in 2 Peter chapter 2 about a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwells righteousness, we tend to think, wow, you know, this is wonderful, isn't it? But he's only quoting really from prophet Isaiah. And there are several quotations in Isaiah that say exactly the same thing. But the whole point is this, isn't it? That it is this concentration of our minds and our thoughts upon the world to come. Because that is our glorious hope, isn't it? We are looking for a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwells righteousness. We are looking for the renovation of this world in which we live at this moment of time. There is this world to come. There is an age coming when everything is going to be changed. And we live, don't we, in anticipation of that. But on top of that, you see, it's not, a, it's not only that we are looking forward in anticipation, but... We could say it like this, what about the present world in which we live? And the present world in which we live is, is a world that is dominated, as we know, by sin. Dominated by death. And there are so many sad things that go on in this world. But what you find here is that here is this picture that is being presented to us. What was God's intention for man when he first created, you know, the world and he put Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden? Do you remember what he said to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, you see, when he first created them. He said to go out and subdue the world, or subdue the earth. The subjugation of the world. The plan and purpose of God was that man would be involved in subduing this world. And in verse 6 here, to verse 8, what you get is a quotation from Psalm 8. Now, I think if you were reading Psalm 8, you would not think of it as a messianic psalm. The only reason you would think of it as a messianic psalm is because there are several occasions in the New Testament, this being one, where it is directly referred to Jesus. And here is the declaration. He says in verse 6, But one testifies in a certain place, saying, what is man that you are mindful of him? Or the son of man that you take care of him? You have made him a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor and set him over the works of your hands. This is what happened in the Garden of Eden, wasn't it? You have put all things in subjection 
under his feet. In other words, man was put in that position where he should have been king of creation. He should have been the one who was in charge of creation itself. He should have been controlling all of these things. And the aim and the destiny and the purpose for which he was living was to subdue the earth. God had made him and put him at the pinnacle of all things that he was king of creation. But of course, what he says in verse 8 is, for in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we do not yet see all things put under him. In other words, everything in creation around and about us has not been subdued up to this particular point in time. He said, if you look at the world, creation hasn't been subdued by man. Why? Well, sin has come into the world and now he's grappling, isn't he? With nature itself, which is in a hostile position and condition to what man wants. When he is trying to subdue, you know, the earth as it were, what do you get? You know, you've got weeds growing all over the place. You know, when you, you look at, you know, the phenomena that it takes place today, the earthquakes, the floods, the fires that we are having at this particular point in time, you know, he's not able to subdue what is taking place. But God's intention and God's plan was always for man to be able to subdue. In other words, that he would be at the pinnacle of things, controlling all of what was going on in nature. But that's not the case now. We do not yet see all things in subjection to him. But, he says, in verse 9, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. See, what he says is this, look, you know, we are casting our eyes around and about us and we don't see this world in which we're living in subjection to man. But, he says, we have to lift our eyes above this world. And we are really now, he says, to focus our attention more upon Jesus. Why? Because Jesus is the one, the man, that will subdue all things to himself. There's an interesting verse in, um, well, an interesting quotation, I suppose, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And the quotation is in verse 27. But it, it, it's interesting, you see, because it's the exact same quotation that we're reading here. For he has put all things under his feet. That's the quotation, and it is from Psalm 8. But in the previous verse, you see, it's at that position in the, ver in the chapter where he says, And he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. So after he's put all enemies under his feet, the last enemy that will be destroyed is death. For he has put all things under his feet. And when he says all things, all things except for God, of course, who is the exception. So the rule that's going to take place is by the rule of man. And in order for, you know, the new creation to take place, a man has to come to subdue all things. And that man is Jesus. How often, you know, when you read in Ephesians chapter 1, for example, isn't it, when you start going through the, that particular chapter, and it speaks about what is being subdued unto him at the very end, isn't it, of the chapter, and it says all principalities, powers, you know, and all authorities are subject to him. You know, he himself is the one who has made all things. He is the one who has through his death, subdued all things. He's the one that we are reading about here, you know, who himself is reigning and will reign over this new creation. Because there is a time coming when we shall see creation itself being subdued to man. But that will be taking place in the person and through the person of Jesus. He is that man who is going to come and fulfill this prophecy in a way in which Adam did not fulfill it. What is man that you were mindful of him, or the son of man that you take care of him? You have made him. And this is talking about Jesus now, isn't it? 
He was talking about man. He was talking about the first creation as well, man in the Garden of Eden. But the emphasis then is passing on to Jesus, isn't it? You have made him a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor and set him over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. Now, the prophecies in the Old Testament obviously deal with Jesus, isn't it? What is the final conclusion of all things? That all nations shall come before him and bow their knee to Jesus. In other words, all things are going to be subjected to him. Principalities, powers to the rulers of those in the heavenly places. They're all going to be subjected to him. He will have absolute authority and absolute power. And he comes as that second man, doesn't he? Or should we say the second Adam, is it? The thing is this, isn't it? That Jesus has done this and we... And encouraged here, isn't it, to fix our eyes not upon what we see around and about us, but to fix our eyes upon Jesus. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering and death, crowned now in the fulfillment of this year with glory and honor. That's where he is now at this point in time, isn't it? That's the pinnacle of where he is. Or we could see it in uh, chapter 1, isn't it, that he is seated at the right hand of the majesty on high. That is where he is. That is his place. But that is his place as man. And you see, all of this is going to come about because of what Jesus has done. The world that was, the world that is to come, all of this is going to be dealt with. There's going to be a reversal of the situation in which we labor at this moment of time. And here is the way in which it's going to be done is through what Jesus has done in dying at Calvary, isn't it? The reversal of everything takes place because of that. Redemption and the redemption of our souls is not only the redemption of our souls and our bodies, but it is the redemption of creation itself. And what Jesus achieved by dying on Calvary is the reversal of the curse of man. And you and I are already involved in that. We are already involved in this new creation that is taking place. This is why Paul, when he's writing to the church at Corinth, he says like this, that we are a new creation in Christ Jesus. There's like an overlap with the, new, with the old and with the new. It is already underway. It is already ongoing. All of us, you and I, who have enjoyed salvation, we have come to faith in Jesus, all of us have been changed. We have become a new creation. We've been born again with the Spirit of God. And so we're already in the process until that new world comes. It's interesting, isn't it? Chapter 6 and verse 5, for example, what you find is that it says like this when the writer is writing and he's talking about certain people and he says, and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come. He's talking about how have we tasted of the powers of the world to come or the age to come? You see, we have experienced something of what belongs to an age that is to come when Jesus comes again. And we have already experienced something of that. We have gone into this process, haven't we, where sin is being put into reverse. You know, God is dealing with us. You know, we are being changed from glory into glory as by the Spirit of the Lord. We are undergoing this process of change until the culmination is that when we see him, we shall be like him. And what you get here is that Jesus has done this, hasn't he? By becoming a man. He couldn't do it as God. He had to do it as a man. And redemption was purchased by a man. It was purchased by that perfect man. And so here we get this description of Jesus in as much, he says in verse 14, isn't it, as I quoted earlier, as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who are the power of death, that is the devil. In other words, here's going to be the reversal, isn't it? The overcoming and the liberation of the people of God and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. In other words, we were under this tyranny, but through the death of Jesus and what he has done, he has liberated us from that tyranny. For indeed, he does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. 
Therefore, in all things, he had to be made like his brethren. Wonderful thing here is that you can see the interconnection. You know, the oneness that uh, comes about in verse 11, it speaks about this oneness, doesn't it? Because it says like this, for both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one. Now, you know, when you read in the writings of the Apostle Paul, of course, he speaks about one body, doesn't he? You know, we're all members of the one body. We're all united. We're all united. Why? Because the Spirit of God has come to inhabit our souls. He's taken possession of us. And because of that situation, it says there in verse 12 that he is, he is uh, I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will sing praise to you. In other words, he's not ashamed, as he says here, isn't it? In verse 11. He's not ashamed to call them brethren. You know, he's gone to the extent of bleeding and dying for them. He's not embarrassed by them. He's not ashamed to be called you and I as brethren, brothers in Christ. He's not ashamed of that. He rejoices in the union that exists between us and him. He is the one who has bled and died for us, isn't it? Here am I and the children whom God has given me. You know, and if you want to see a bit of that, isn't it? You go back to John chapter 17, isn't it? The description of, you know, when he's praying to his father, you know, these are those whom you have given me. They were yours, but you've given them to me. You know, and the oneness, you know, this wonderful union that exists between the head and the body, between Christ and ourselves, between the church as the bride of Christ. But the interesting thing here is, you see, that in his existential situation in this world, and all the suffering that he went through and the you know, things that he was going through at that particular time, the temptations, and they were real temptations that he went through. He knows, you know, how to give aid. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. Or in chapter 4, isn't it, in verse 16, you know, you get this picture, isn't it, that he was tempted in all points like as we are yet without sin. We have this high priest who can be touched by the feelings of our infirmities, can sympathize with our situation. Why? Because he existed as a man. And as a man, he knows what it is to be tempted. He knows what it is to go through these trials, these difficulties. And so he loves his brothers. Therefore, in all things, he had to be made like his brethren or brothers, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. You see, here is somebody who is sympathetic with our situation, who feels for us in the trials that we are going through. The one who has gone through all of this destroyed him with the power of death. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. When death has ended, what shall be? It shall be the subjugation of all of what sin has denuded this creation of. And then we get this picture, the curse shall be no more in the book of Revelation at the end, isn't it? The curse has been removed. Christ has come. The glory has been revealed. The church has come down out of heaven. Just one last quotation I want to give to you, and it's in uh, chapter 13. And here in this particular picture, it tells us that we do not have a city, no continuing city in this world. But we're looking forward, he says, to a city. And if I could find it here, it would be helpful, right? But it is in the chapter. <laughs> I can assure you. <laughs> but it talks about us looking forward in anticipation to this city. The city of God, isn't it? The picture that is to be ours. That place where we shall be with him in glory. And that's what we are looking for now, isn't it? At this particular time in verse 14 it says here, For here we have no continuing city, but we seek the one to come. I mean, I could take you into Hebrews chapter 11, but my time has run out, to be honest. But it's so much, isn't it, of what both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament of people, you know, who look for a city which has foundations, builder and maker is God, you know. They were 
all looking in forward in anticipation. They didn't belong to this world and they didn't see this as everything. And sadly, that is the state and the condition that people find themselves in, isn't it? They're bound, earthbound. But you and I have been liberated from that. Liberated from that, liberated from the fear of death because of what Jesus has done for us. And this world to come is a world that's going to be dominated by the fact that Jesus has done all of this for us. And there will be no sin, there will be no, no, no sadness or sorrow, but the emphasis of their preaching, and this was the point that I started with, the emphasis of their preaching was that they spoke about a world to come. And how we need to come back to this time and time again, isn't it, to, to focus our minds upon this, you know, that this world is not everything, but we are looking forward to the world to come. And by looking forward to the world to come, you know, we can liberate ourselves from this world. Not be tied to it, but realize that this world is not everything. But we have a world to come. And we have experienced something of the powers of that world, even in this life. Because of what God has done to us, and what God has done within us. Well, let's pray. Our Father, as we look to you again, and we give you thanks that... You've done such a wonderful thing. You have begun a new creation within us and we realize, Lord, that we are just those who are motoring along and waiting for that day when we shall be brought into the liberty of the children of God. When death shall be no more and we shall see Christ as he is, we shall be like him. Thank you for the liberty that is ours in Christ. So remember us, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to sing together now. We're going to sing together. Look, ye saints, the sight is glorious. Yeah.